Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Pablo and Crane. So today we have a bit of a, a special episode because uh, one of our guests cancelled. So, and, and next week there's the Inside Bitcoins conference coming up. I'm going to be giving a talk uh, on the Inside Bitcoins at the Inside Bitcoins conference about a um, topic that I've been thinking about a lot, which is uh, the economics of proof of work and the security of proof of work. So this episode today we're going to dive into that. And it's a practice run. <laughs> it's a practice run, yeah. yeah. But I think it will be very interesting. There's some, uh, some. Uh, I have this scary attack scenario that I've. It's been on my mind for a while. There's actually quite a few times I've asked guests about that, and they often had like brief answers. But today we really dive into that. So. Uh, so actually, what? So th this is this is a topic that Brian is doing a lot of research on. I'm sort of following from a distance because you know. It, it, since he's sort of interested in them taking interest, but I, I mean, he had to walk me through the whole attack scenario uh, before the show in order for me to at least get an idea of what uh, what this entails. So I'll, so I guess today Brian's sort of the guest. Uh, in, in a sense, I'll be asking him some questions, and we'll try to uh, explain this uh, this attack scenario that he, well, him and others have been uh, imagining. Um, and uh, yeah, so it'll be sort of a way for you to practice your talk and also for me to get more understanding about this topic, which uh, up until now I had very little knowledge about. Um, so speaking of, uh, speaking of uh, Inside Bitcoins, so uh, Inside Bitcoins Berlin is happening on the, so this week, that is... Thursday, Friday. Thursday, Friday, the 5th and 6th, right? And there's a Bitcoin meetup on Wednesday too. Um, Actually, yeah, in Berlin. Yeah. So, I'm going. I'm going to be in Berlin tomorrow, uh, as of Monday, or the day this is released. Uh, really excited about that. And so, if you want to, if you want to go to Inside Bitcoins uh, Berlin, you can get 15% off by using the code Epicenter IBC, all in caps, uh, Epicenter IBC, and you get 15% off. And uh, so, I'll be there. Uh, can't wait to go. So excited to leave tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we get started, too, there's another thing uh, we want to briefly mention. Um, so as uh, as many of our listeners know, this show started as uh, an entry and a, and a contest in the LTB network. Uh, we came in second place in that contest. That was over a year ago. And at the time, we had the opportunity to join the network. We went back and forth with Adam about it and sort of debated for a long time whether we wanted to do that or not. And at the time, we... Uh, came to the conclusion that it wasn't right for us at that, at that moment and we decided to, to stay independent and to do our own thing. Uh, we stay in good contact with LTB and we think that they produce really good content uh, and all the shows there on the network really successful. Um, so recently when we had Adam on again, uh, we, we sort of reopened the discussion with him and a lot of people in the comment sections were saying, you guys should join LTB and so it kind of Gave Where's us the, the magic idea. word? Where's the magic word? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, oh, uh, long story short, so we decided that we would like now, now that we've sort of established our brand and we've established a show and you know we've kind of grown to where we are today, that we wanted to join the LTB network. So this show will be the first show uh, on the LTB network since the pilot, actually. Uh, so our show will still be available. Like if you listen to the show now, it'll still be available on the feed that you listen to on iTunes or SoundCloud. We'll be on our own um, YouTube channel as well. But we'll now also be on LTB channel distribution, the LTB distribution channel. So that means there are RSS on iTunes and any other podcast app that you listen to, that you use on on their SoundCloud page as well. I might no no not the SoundCloud page, but in their RSS feed and as well on their iOS app. So we're really excited about that for several reasons. One, I mean, it's just, it's an opportunity for us to reach another part of the Bitcoin community that we haven't been reaching so far, and also to be in touch with the LTB community, which, I mean, is is quite a large community with lots of interesting people, and there's a lot of discussion happening there. So, um, yeah. So having said that, so we'll also be doing the magic word as of now. Um, so at some point during the show, the pay you'll... attention. What's that? The pay attention. Yeah. Uh, at some point during the show, you'll you'll hear the magic word, and then you'll be able to go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, 
and get your listener award. So for those of you who don't know uh, how this works, uh, if you don't listen to LTB at all, you've never heard of the magic word concept. The idea is that uh, as a reward for listening to the show, uh, you get some LTB coin. LTB coin is, of course, Let's Talk Bitcoin's uh, currency, which is built on top of Counterparty. Uh, once you hear the magic word, you have seven days to go to letstalkbitcoin.com, sign in, and in your account, there'll be a, a place where you can enter the magic word, and you'll get part of the listener reward. It's sort of a way for you to get rewarded for listening to the show, which is what makes the success of the show, really, and also a way for us to know who's listening and get some analytics and feedback on uh, on who's listening. So we look forward to uh, to this uh, new adventure. Uh, look forward to uh, growing some more and growing with LTV, and yeah, we couldn't be more excited. Absolutely. Okay, should so, we get started? Yeah, we should, definitely. Um, so, you were telling me about this uh, attack scenario that it, that is being talked about, and it's it's based on well, what will happen in 2016, which is the block uh, well, reward we'll have. Um, well, I would put it like this, actually. The, the attack scenario that I've been thinking about it's it's sort of a broader it's a broader question right it's just a question like what makes bitcoin secure and uh, how is the security going to develop and what's the risk of an attack happening i actually didn't think of it in terms of uh, the 2016 block halving but i was talking with jonathan levin about it a few days ago and he mentioned that and 2016 indeed will be sort of an ideal time to execute this attack but it doesn't, it's not limited to then. It could happen sort of any time or later too, and if it doesn't happen then, it could happen some other time. Right, so, so this attack can happen, it could happen now, it could happen in the future. Just the now, block having gives initial, uh, additional incentive to do that. Yeah, it can't really happen now, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, but maybe to, to start off, uh, we, let's take a step back and think about, you know, what makes Bitcoin secure, right? And uh, I mean, in Bitcoin, sort of the truth or the, the state of Bitcoin is determined by the longest blockchain, right? So the, the longest chain of blocks. And the security in Bitcoin is 100% a, a an economic concept, right? It, it comes from the idea that uh, the longest chain is the true chain. And as long as a majority of the Bitcoin network is honest, then, uh, you know, you can't attack it, right? So this is, so it's an economic uh, concept of security because if somebody has unlimited resources, unlimited money, unlimited hashing power, they can obviously uh, get the majority of the hashing power and they can be the true chain. And in that case, sort of all bets are off. Like you can do all kinds of evil things. So I think the important thing to realize there is that, you know, Bitcoin security, um, is an economic concept. It's a concept of cost. The question is like, how much does it cost you to get the majority of the hashing power? And Bitcoin is secure as long as it costs you so much that nobody has an incentive to do that. Um, I think that's sort of the, the core, the core idea of Bitcoin security. And also, where one can sort of think about is Bitcoin actually secure? Because of course, the question then come up if if you think of security in that way. Uh, number one, uh, who has an incentive to attack Bitcoin? How large is that incentive? And number two, uh, how much does it cost to attack Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is only secure so long that the cost of attacking Bitcoin is larger um, than what you can get out of attacking Bitcoin. And when that reverses and you start to be able to get more from attacking than the attack itself costs you, Bitcoin is no longer secure. Bitcoin becomes very, very uh, vulnerable to attacks. And the sort of uh, case, a claim I want to make here is that I think this is going to reverse this, uh, this relationship in the future. And it will be possible to make more money from attacking Bitcoin than it costs you. Like today, that's not the case, I think. Today, uh, it will probably be, you probably wouldn't be able to make more money from an attack than it costs you. But in the future, I think you will be. So that's the sort of the, the main case. I think it's a very scary scenario. I remember recently we had a podcast with Tim Swanson. Somebody commented, like, God, this was so depressing for Bitcoin. 
Uh, well, you get another one of those today. <laughs> So, um, so to just to sum up, the, the security of the Bitcoin network is is based on the cost of, of attacking it, and what you're proposing here is that, well, what you're theorizing is that that cost, those 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 costs will flip at some point uh, in the future. Yeah, we'll right. So the, there's uh, the cost, the, the, and there's the and there's how much to make from it, right? Because if it's if it's uh, relatively cheap to attack Bitcoin, but there's no way to benefit from an attack, then, well, you can also say it's kind of secure, relatively. Right. Yeah. Of course, ideally, we would like to have the cost of attacking Bitcoin be really, really high and the potential payoff be much lower, and then we could say Bitcoin's really secure. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, well, let's talk about the attack, right? So, uh, there are sort of two parts to the attack. Number one is you short Bitcoin. So uh, for those who don't know, shorting Bitcoin essentially means that uh, you make a bet with someone uh, on the Bitcoin price. And so, for example, me and Sebastian, we make a bet on the Bitcoin price. And if the Bitcoin price by, let's say, June 1st is below $30, Sebastian pays me $1,000. And if I'm wrong and it's above $30, then I pay Sebastian $100, something like that. Um, so, so first, someone, the attacker takes a large short position on Bitcoin, so that if Bitcoin collapses dramatically the price, they make a lot of money from that. And two, you spend money on attacking Bitcoin, destroying the trust in the currency, and, and collapsing the price. That's sort of the, um, the way you would do this. So the consequences of that also are that you are willing to lose money on the attack. So it's not, if, if you sort of look at Bitcoin in isolation without the shorting that's happening elsewhere, uh, the attacker is losing money. He's spending money to uh, sort of undermine Bitcoin and, and that's money lost. He's not gonna get it back. Um, so most often, I think, when people thought about 51% attack, they thought about double spending. Uh, and, and of course, that I think makes not really a lot of sense because, you know, what can you do with double spending? Steal yeah, some if the, so if there's a double spend attack, what happens is people lose the trust in a network and your Bitcoins are worth less. Yeah, I mean, of course, you can... If you, you could do, still imagine that you'd be making money if, if you know, the, if the, the difference between what you've made and the reduction right. price is still higher. Or, or it, you do it on some exchange and then you get like a hundred thousand extra Dogecoin or something. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, the potential payoff of a double spend on the Bitcoin network is just, I don't think it, it's very large and I don't think it will be very large, you know. I mean, no, I do, that, that's what a lot of, that's what most people think about when, when you talk about a 51% attack, what gets talked about the most is this double spend. Exactly, so people but, can buy shoes and then get their Bitcoins back to buy shoes again. Right. But, I mean, but what you're saying is uh, that's very unlikely. The, 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 the attack scenario is much more dire than a uh, simple double spend attack, which... Yeah, I think the real danger comes when an attacker does not care about, uh, like, does not is not trying to double spend any money or anything like that. Is just trying to undermine Bitcoin, um, and and you know that's that's really where it becomes dangerous. So, um, so how would you do that? So first of all, uh, we need to talk about the short position. If you wanted to do that as an attacker, you would need to have a short position that pays you out in, in dollars or in some fiat currency, right? Because if you're kind of destroying Bitcoin, you don't want to like then make a lot of Bitcoins in the process. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it would, it would make no sense if you were shorting for Bitcoin and then the price goes like drops. What are you going to do with that? Yeah, exactly. So so you need to have, uh, so you need to make your money in, in dollars, for example. But that's like right now, so I don't think right now this wouldn't be possible. But in the future, um, let's say on Wall Street, there are some investment banks that start order derivatives that are based on Bitcoin. Um, then I could make a contract with some hedge funds, some banks, etc., that pay me 
a certain amount of dollars if the Bitcoin price goes below a certain amount. And then I don't need to own any Bitcoins to have that position. And the other party doesn't need to own any Bitcoins to have that position. It's really a, it's a, a counterparty risk then. Like, you know, basically I trust the other party that they have the ability to pay if to make good on their promise. And, and it's the same thing on my side. Uh, so it also means the attacker should probably be a, some sort of financial institution, hedge fund in particular. Um, and an, another way could be, for example, if there's an ETF, right? Often there's abilities to uh, short the ETF. So if the Winklevoss twins uh, get their ETF through, one could maybe short that. Let's say uh, there are some Bitcoin companies that go public, Coinbase maybe, they have an IPO, you could short their stock. And, and an attacker ideally would, would short all kinds of things, right? Like you wouldn't have like one party to have a big short position against, but you would have 50 different parties. So maybe you would do all at the same time. You short the Bitcoin stock, you would do that, you do that, you do that. Um, uh, try to get some <coughs> derivatives to short it. And, and that way you could accumulate a large short position that let's say if Bitcoin price totally collapses, you make 500 million or something like that. Or maybe less, maybe 100 million is enough to incentivize an attack. Um, and and it's a, what's important to realize also is that when we talk about a Wall Street derivatives market, it's very, it's not transparent. So, I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I think it might be possible to accumulate a significant short position without people knowing about this. Like, it may not drive the Bitcoin price down directly. Uh, at least it, there will be some delay for that happening, and, and you could you could try to uh, execute part of the attack in a, in a covert way. Um, and then, of course, yeah, the consequence is like you can't do this attack today, uh, like because you you can't do a, a big enough short position today. But I think you will be in the future, right? So it, especially if Bitcoin is successful. I, mean, I think that that's the interesting thing about uh, this scenario and the sort of interesting thing about the larger point here is that um, I think Bitcoin may become less secure as it becomes more successful because you start having much larger incentives to, uh, to attack Bitcoin. So that's sort of the, the, very, broad, uh, the very broad picture thing. And now we will talk about this kind of like really in depth on, on how to execute this. Does this, uh, does this scare you, Sebastian? Does, does it make sense for roughly? Well, one, one, thing that, uh, one thing that I noticed in here is that, so when we think about this attack scenario, um, when, we take a, when we think about attack scenarios, I, myself, uh, in, in, in any case, I see it as sort of like a point in time where, in fact, it, it could take place over a very long time. So uh, if there's a Bitcoin ETF or if a CoinDesk goes public, people people can start shorting now. So someone who's planning planning an attack for say in five or ten years, or maybe not that long, but you know, sometime in the future, they can start setting that up now by placing short positions against Bitcoin. You know, so it, so it doesn't look at that at the point like when they're doing the attack, it doesn't. Yeah. Like doing the attack, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, well, yes and no. I mean, I think uh, to to hold a short position, you generally you have to pay some money on that. Like at least you reserve capital on that, so it's not free, right? Um, so I I don't think it would make sense like to go that far ahead. But you could have a few months, right? Like maybe over a few months, you would accumulate a short position. That, that's that's definitely true, right? So you would you would you would do that gradually. Um, that's correct. Um, so then how how would such an attack be executed? So basically, the attacker would would try to control the majority of the network. And then what an attacker can do, and there may be several ways of, of basically disrupting trust in Bitcoin at that stage, but one sort of very simple way would just be to mine empty blocks. So whenever another miner mines a block, you go back to your own chain and you keep mining empty blocks. And uh, 
The consequence of that, of course, would be that nobody can spend your bitcoins anymore. Right. So if I'm if I uh, try to send Sebastian some bitcoins during that attack, like my wallet could send out uh, the bitcoin into the network, but because the majority of miners are only mining empty block and they disregard any block, including transactions, no transaction will ever get into a block. Of course, how long would it take for people on Reddit to go crazy? It's like, you know, this this is an attack that would be uh, executed in the open. Uh, you know, you would tell people about it, you would show it to people, and the very point would be the panic that ensues. Um, so, So there, there are basically. So at this stage, um, that that's a sort of you know the broad, the broad picture, uh, the broad picture situation. Now so you're shorting. So you're shorting Bitcoin on one side. You on in the on the fiat world, I guess. Okay, with dollars or whatever, and you're uh, leveraging a large. Uh, you're controlling a large portion of the network to mine empty blocks, uh, so the transactions don't um, don't go through. And a consequence of this, and the like you said, the panic and the mayhem is that people try to sell their bitcoins on exchanges. Right, because and the, the price goes down. Yeah, because the point is, uh, you would still be able to trade bitcoin on exchanges because they're of course off chain, right? So like somebody on uh, Coinbase. Exchange or on Bitfinex or on uh, on all these other exchanges, at, at least uh, the conventional exchanges would still be able to trade uh, their bitcoins. Um, so you could totally have people selling their coins. Um, you just couldn't get them out. Right. So it's in a, it's a little bit similar. It could be a, a bit of a similar scenario as it happens with Mount Gox. You know where where there was that other thing. Uh, Bitcoin Builder, it was called, where you could trade Mount Gox coins, even though you couldn't access them, you couldn't move them. So this would be a little bit similar. So you know, maybe I could still trade the coins on some exchange, without being able to withdraw them. And you know, the hope, I guess, of those people trading the coins would be that you know, once you're able to withdraw them again, they would recover in value or something. But of course, that's uh, it, it would be very scary. It also means that only the people would be able to trade the coins. That already have them on an exchange, right? Everybody who holds them on in wallets elsewhere uh, wouldn't be able to do that. Now, where does the uh, how does the block having uh, the block reward having uh, fit into this scenario? Um, well, that, I mean, that, that's sort of the amplifier that that really makes it that much more interesting. That's true, but well, actually, let's talk first about the the mining pool. Okay. Because right, so, uh, one so of you, the, had to, you had this idea about uh, what you call a kamikaze mine, mining pool. Right. So um, just let me see if I can. I can uh, show the. So the mining pool basically. The, the, so the issue here is, as an attacker, like buying fifty-one percent of the mining power. It, you know, it's actually it may be complicated. You may not have access to that, right? So one way of dealing with this situation is that you try to bribe people to join your attack. Um, and, and so you create your own mining pool um, that, that pays people to mine uh, with you and mine all these empty blocks. So let's say I, as an attacker, only have 30% of the hashing power. I can pay uh, other people to join me and attack Bitcoin that way. And the point is that I can pay way more than other mining pools because I'm making money on the short. So I could say I pay each miner who mines with me 10 times as much as if you mine with another pool. So from sort of a game theoretic perspective, yeah, we've pulled up the, the situation, like it looks like this. 
as a miner, I, I now have the choice. Like, do I mine with the kamikaze pool who's, that's attacking Bitcoin, or do I not mine with that? If I not mine with that, I just have my usual, you know, one, my usual reward. Uh, and then, you know, if the attack succeeds, then I am pretty, I'm pretty fucked, right? So first of all, my mining hardware has become worthless. Second of all, I, I only have my minimal uh, block reward. Actually, not even, right? Because uh, if I mine a block, um, it gets undone by the mining pool. So I, I actually make zero. This is slightly wrong. And if the attack fails, well then okay, I still have my mining hardware, it's still worth something, and I had the minimal reward during that time. Um, but if the attack succeeds, and I mine with the pool, okay, the mining hardware I own has become worthless, but I have made, you know, ten times as much money. And another scenario would be that the attack fails, but I mined during the time of the attack with that mining pool. And the attractive thing there is that, on the one hand, my mining hardware still has some value because now the attack is gone, the attacker's gone, failed, and I can still make money from mining Bitcoins. Uh, and I also got paid for participating in the attack because, of course, I can, I can join or get out of the attack at any time. Um, so that's... The, and, of course... Uh, what we do see here is that in either case, whether or not I believe as a miner, let's say I'm a miner and I have 1% of the hashing power, I'm always better off uh, joining this attack, whether or not it succeeds or not. Now, so the, um, the, the, the person or the party uh, coordinating the attack would need to pay those miners so we brought this up before when we were talking about it. So how would they pay them? The, the options they have, I guess, is to pay them with Bitcoin. They also can pay them with fiat through bank tr transfer. They could pay them through PayPal, presumably. But if they try to pay them through Bitcoin, uh, the whole point of this attack is to get the Bitcoin price down. Well, yeah. th for, 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 for the miner who's uh, taking part in this kamikaze pool, there's no incentive there. So they would have to pay them in some other some, by some other means. Yeah, no, this is a great point. Um, I mean, yeah, you mentioned so, perhaps paying them with with an altcoin, uh, but one could imagine that if you undermine the whole security of Bitcoin as a system, you can also that would probably undermine and absolutely cause the price of altcoins to also go down. Right. So uh, no, it's a great point, and that's I think not a trivial problem. Is like how would how would the attackers pay people to join? Because you're correct. Like if you pay people with Bitcoin, you know what's the point? I mean, you could in theory imagine that they pay with Bitcoin. Uh, because the mine, the attacker could still put in transactions in the block, so you could still pay them with Bitcoin. You could even imagine that you pay them into their exchange address if they have a, an exchange a pay in address, but then maybe the exchange would block those, so eh, not so great, right? So you, you'd want to pay them outside of the Bitcoin network, that's true. Mm. And um, presumably, since this is all unregulated, uh, so what you're pointing, what you were saying, pointing out earlier, is that this is actually legal currently. I mean, we, I mean, it wouldn't be illegal to do this. So, using traditional financial payment systems like fiat or uh, like bank transfers or Western Union or or PayPal or something else would feasibly, like conceivably, be feasible. Well, I, I was thinking about this before, like after you mentioned it, because you you're certainly right. It is a, it is something that would need to be done somehow. Uh, one way perhaps to do it. So if you mine on this Kamikaze blog, of course you, you will have some sort of cryptographic proof that you've done so, right? You could, like, it should be possible to prove cryptographically that you've provided certain hashing power for a certain time there. Um, so one thing you could do as an attacker, let's say, uh, maybe some of you are aware of a thing called Codius. Uh, so it's basically some sort of oracle thing. So you have a, a a bunch of no, uh, servers that verify if something is true, uh, and then you know it, it executes something. We can think of, or simple, similar to a, an Ethereum contract. Let's let's think as an attacker. I would put up an Ethereum contract where automatically, if anyone puts in, um, submits the proof that they've mined on my attacking pool, they get paid. 
Uh, now, I don't know if Ethereum is going to be working, etc. But if not, Codius is a Ripple project. So maybe you could use Ripple for that. Or there should be some way to do it. Uh, at the extreme case, because this is legal, I think, uh, you could, uh, for example, have a law firm make some sort of public statement that anybody who submits proof that they've worked on the pool uh, get paid and there could be some sort of proof of that the money is there. Uh, it seems um, kind of unlikely, though. Huh? It seems kind of unlikely, though. Why not? I, don't, I mean, that... What what law firm is going to participate in something? Like oh, 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 plenty. No, there's not going to be any problem. I mean, I think in Germany, one common thing is like these law firms who send letters to everyone, threatening them that they need to pay money because of like supposedly uh, illegally downloading files. I mean, there's all kind. Of, you will not have any problem finding a law firm for this. Okay. <laughs> but but the disadvantage of this would be that. Uh, like ideally, you have it totally trustless. The, the advantage would be if you pay uh, people joining your pool in Bitcoin is that they immediately get the payment. They see you're not lying. They see you really are paying for that. Whereas if I had some law firm make that declaration, you, make the, you need to have some trust that the law firm then will really pay. So ideally, you have this trustless so that anybody who joins in the pool knows that they're actually going to get paid for joining in that. So having some sort of uh, cryptographic thing would be better. So I think um, code use might be one way. So you have basically people submit the proof that they've uh, joined the attack, uh, and then they get paid some money on the Ripple network, or or in some other some any other crypto um, currency network would probably suffice. And ideally, you know, if it's let's say Ripple network they could pick, get paid in, in US dollars, right, or something right. like that. Okay. Well, there's lots of uh, components to this, and <laughs> there's there definitely more to come. Uh, so we'll talk about the black reward having you know, part of it in just a minute. Before we do that, we'd like to talk about Shapeshift. Shapeshift, as you know, is the fast and easy way to convert uh, your Litecoin, your altcoins into Bitcoin or vice versa. Uh, so they support, uh, well, they're adding new coins all the time. I'm looking at their website now. They have Unobtainium now as a coin. I'm not sure. Unobtainium. Unobtainium is now a coin on Shapeshift. It sounds very hard to get. It so, probably yeah, was, yeah, so probably you can, was unobtainable until Shapeshift showed up. Exactly. So now you can <laughs> trade uh, your Bitcoins for Unobtainium. Who would have thought? Who would have thought you could have, ever obtain Unobtainium? Now they're going to have to rename it to Obtainium. Yeah. So uh, Shapeshift is the currency, the uh, Google Translate of currency conversion tool. So you just uh, go to the website, uh, you choose a currency you want to convert and the currency you want to convert to. You uh, put the payment address and you just uh, send the payment. And uh, in a few seconds, you get uh, whatever currency on your wallet. And so last week we talked about one of their tools, which is the Shapeshift Lens. Uh, today I want to talk about um, another tool that they've developed called the Shifty Button. So let me just share my screen here. I love the name, by the way. Uh, shifty button, here it is. All right, so if I'm looking here on the, so I go to shapeshift.io, I click on tools, and I've got the uh, generator here for the shifty button. So basically what this allows you to do is to integrate shift shift right into your website. And I'm gonna show you how that works, because we've uh, I've added it on our uh, donations page. So here, if you've ever been to our donations page, we used to have our uh, Litecoin and uh, uh, Dogecoin address, but we don't even need that now, uh, just because I can use this uh, this uh, Shapeshift button. So what I've done is I've uh, went on their site, I've copied in my destination address, uh, didn't specify an amount, I generated the code, and oh, let's just try to do it in here. I'm going to grab my uh, Bitcoin address, put it here, generate code. And so it gives you this, this blob of HTML code, uh, JavaScript. You paste it into your website. In our case, we're using WordPress. And we get this pay with altcoins button, which is really great. You just click on it. You get the shapeshift window that comes up. And it allows you to send whatever 
you, to send a donation to the Bitcoin address in whatever coin you want. So in this case, you can say you want to... Unobtainium. Unobtainium, you want to tip with Unobtainium, you can do that. Uh, you can you can uh, give an email address. I, I believe you have to plug in their API to get that information. But uh, if you could just tip like this, you hit submit, that will generate the QR code which uh, you will send your Unobtainium to. And in just a few minutes, uh, that will get converted back to Bitcoin and sent on our address. So this is a great way for you to uh, diversify the types of coins that you accept for payment, for example, on an e-commerce website or just in our case, as, our, as we're doing, for tips. So head over to shapeshift.io, give it a try, and we'd like to shape, thank Shapeshift for the support of Epicenter Bitcoin. And, and if you want to if you want to donate some of that unobtainium that you've worked very hard to obtain, uh, you can do that at <laughs> on our website now. Finally. Yeah. Put that unobtainium to good use. So let's talk about the uh, well, well, the the last component to this attack scenario, which is uh, what I guess kind of tips the tips the scales um, and makes makes this all possible, makes this all well profitable at least. Uh, yeah. Possible from an economic sense. Well, I, 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 you know, the thing is, I think this can be uh, profitable from an economic sense in any case. I, I think in any case, this is a very big danger. But then I was, uh, I was running uh, with Jonathan Levine through this. Uh, as some of you may know, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Levin, he's been on the podcast before. Uh, I, mean, I think maybe twice or something. Yeah. And uh, he was the CEO of Coinometrics until recently. Um, and so he's very, you know, very smart guy and really understands a lot of the sort of economic issues around Bitcoin. So when I was talking to him about it, he mentioned, oh, you know, but you know, the block reward halving would be the perfect time to, to do an attack like this. And I hadn't even thought of it in that context, but then, uh, yes, so that's, he's very much right that this would be the perfect time uh, to uh, execute an attack like this. Um, so, and it would be, you know, it would be dangerous time for Bitcoin, I think, when the, the block reward halving happens. So, as, as all of you will know, the Bitcoin block reward halves every four years, right? It started off with 50 Bitcoins originally. Then, after four years, so that was in 2012, I think. Um, so, it must have been the end of 2012 or something. Uh, it dropped from 50 to 25, and you know, currently for every block a miner gets 25. And then in 2016, it's gonna half again to to 12 and a half, and you know, so it's gonna keep going like that basically until it's at zero. And um, so, what are the consequences of that? Of course, the consequences of that is that for a miner, it dramatically in decreases revenues from like one day to the next. Because, like, you know, let's say it's 2016, the block reward halvings happens now. So today, I'm making um, 25 Bitcoins per block. Tomorrow, the same block being mined, I only make half as much. Um, and this will immediately render a, a large portion of the mining market uh, unprofitable. So I think today, estimates are that Miners spend about 80% of their revenues on electricity. So if this happened today, a block reward halving, right? So we would have of for every hundred dollars a miner's earned, he was spending 80 on electricity and 20 dollars was spent to like amortize the hardware and and for profit. So if you had a block reward halving today, that hundred dollars would go down to 50 dollars. And each miner would lose thirty dollars. You know, for every hundred dollars they have revenue, uh, every fifty dollars have revenue now. You know, they would lose thirty dollars. Um, of course, what are the consequences of that? It's not very hard to uh, imagine. People would uh, turn off their hardware, right? Uh, so a lot of people would turn off their hardware, which would have uh, two consequences. Uh, the first one is that the difficulty or the hash rate would dramatically uh, collapse, right? So you may have from one day to the next, maybe 30% of the hash rate would go away or maybe even more. Um, 
And the other thing is that now you have all this mining hardware that has essentially become worthless. Right? Because as a miner, let's say I was, I was making a little bit of money with my mining hardware, now the block rewards collapsed, I'm making zero, like this is standing around here, you know, it's basically worthless. What so, are you going to do? You're going to put it on eBay? Yeah, put it, put it on eBay. Sale or? Put it on eBay or uh, I could mine with it if some attacker comes in and says, I pay you anyway. I pay you 10 times as much, you know, like, so all of a sudden you may have the choice between this being totally worthless and someone still paying you for it, right, paying you to join that attack. So, so that's so those are the two the two components that are going to make this a very dangerous time. Is that one is the hash rate is going to collapse, um, and two is that a lot of cheap mining hardware uh, and cheap hashing power will be up for sale. And and it's and of course it's not like everybody's going to stop mining, right? Because some people have different cost structures, right? Like some people will get free electricity if you if you like the son of some governor in China and like you can get like the government to pay for your electricity you will keep mining because like your marginal costs are maybe zero um, or very close to zero so but but for others it would be different right like anyone in anyone with a higher electricity cost will probably have to stop mining today's magic word is security s e c u r i t y Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. This incentive to stop mining uh, when the when the block reward halves, th does the Bitcoin price have any uh, influence in that at all? Like, does is it is it different if the Bitcoin price is at a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, or is it completely independent? Well, it's kind of independent, right? Like, I mean, what what matters is what really matters is what percentage of uh, your revenues you spend on a, on cost like you know w how much margin do you have because let's say um, for a thousand dollars revenues you make with your miners like your costs are only a hundred dollars now if those thousands go down to five hundred well, that's bad, but you're still going to keep mining, right? Like, it's not like, I mean, you may be less happy about it, but it's not going to change so much. But it's very different if your costs are a, very, a large percentage of your revenues. And, and we should also mention, of course, uh, what matters here is what, how much money are managed making from transaction fees? Well, it's because today it's basically nothing. Like, today it's, it's a very, very small percentage uh, I don't remember how much it was, but it's definitely much less than 5%, I think maybe 2% or even less. Um, so if this happened today, miners would basically lose almost 50% of their revenues. Now in 2016, maybe it's going to be different, right? Maybe miners make, uh, maybe miners make 30% of their revenues, or, or let's say miners make 40% of their revenues um, from uh, from transaction fees, then this wouldn't be quite so terrible, right? So let's say for a hundred dollars uh, before the block reward half in 2016, they make sixty dollars from the block reward and forty dollars from the transaction fees. Now the sixty dollars get halved, right? So even a miners would lose thirty percent of their revenues. So it may be something like that. I don't know. Uh, so it, it will, will probably won't be quite fifty percent at least if transaction fee revenues increases, but it will be very, very substantial. Uh, I don't think there's, you know, I don't think uh, transaction fees are going to be like 10 times the size of the block reward. There's absolutely no sign for something like that happening. Okay. So if, if we just bring that all around, so you've got uh, the, all the components. So one is the, uh, the shorting. So you short uh, Bitcoin. You short that the Bitcoin price is going to go down. Second component is uh, uh, controlling a large part of the network, and that becomes possible when a lot of the miners are turning off their hardware, so the, the hash rate goes way, way down. It becomes a lot more easy for anybody to get 51% or more, and on top of that, you get all these miners uh, with, with hardware that's serving no purpose that they can rent or sell 
to a potential attacker. And those are sort of the three pillars that make this whole attack vector possible. Exactly. And, and I think the interesting thing about uh, the value of the mining hardware dropping uh, and the block reward dropping, the point is that even, even if you still can profitably mine after the block reward halving, your hardware has still lost a lot of its value, right? So even if, even if I would still keep on mining, I would still be willing to sell it for much, much cheaper uh, because I'm making a lot less money. Now, to be honest, there is sort of one, one thing uh, a friend of mine has mentioned is that to some extent miners will anticipate this, right? To some extent miners will know the block reward is going to go down, so I'm going to invest less in hardware. So we may see some decline in investment, or we will see some decline in investment, uh, you know, in the six months or something like that before the block reward halves. So that, that will, you know, mitigate this a little bit. So it may not be quite as bad, you know, maybe then the drop in the hash rate will be 30% instead of 40% or, or something like that. But uh, there's going to be a significant drop. I don't think uh, there's any way sort of around that. So one one thing that comes to mind uh, when talking about the, the block reward having is that, well, this happened before. We had a, a block reward half in 2012, as you mentioned. Why didn't it happen then? What are... The difference is how, how is the Bitcoin network and ecosystem different now than then, and why wouldn't we have seen that scenario in a couple of years, a couple of years ago? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I mean, actually, I should give also some credit here uh, to a guy named uh, Alex Misra, something like that, because there was a there's an interesting uh, thread on the Bitcoin Dev mailing list uh, on this, on the block reward halving, and and that was one of the answers of Gavin and Reeson is like, oh, well, didn't we see that in 2012? Nothing happened. And uh, I, I don't think the situation is comparable at all for a few reasons. So number one is there were no ASICs in 2012, right? So it was a very different mining environment. You know, people were mining on, I think, GPUs probably. I'm not even sure, but like, uh, so it, it was a different environment. Uh, mining was also less profit oriented, right? I mean, this was still a time when people were like mining at home and all that stuff. Uh, mining with their own like self-constructed hardware and, and a lot of Bitcoin enthusiasts were mining. Uh, I, this has already been changing dramatically, right? I mean, today mining is sort of a for-profit business. I don't think there are a lot of sort of Bitcoin enthusiasts left who mine just for the fun of it. It just doesn't make sense financially. Um, also, I think the profit margins are different. You know, back then, uh, I guess it's hard to know. I'm not sure how it was back then with the graphic cards and all. But, you know, today, uh, what we are seeing is that the cost of mining are becoming higher versus the revenue. So it's getting very tight, right? It's a very competitive market. And I think that's going to increase even more until 2016. So, so people will have a, a tight margin, high profit margin. That makes this more vulnerable. And, and then the last point, which is very important, is that in 2012, the, there was no way to short Bitcoin. You couldn't take a short, a large short position on Bitcoin. Um, and I guess that's one more thing. I don't think there was a way to rent mining hardware remotely, right? Because what is going to happen is, is you're going to have data centers that have mining hardware in it, and anybody can sort of rent the mining hardware, the hashing power, uh, and, and direct it to the pool they want to, whatever they want, without actually being there and, and you know, getting the hardware shipped and all of that stuff, right? So you, you wouldn't have to do that. In 2012, that was, there wasn't a way to do that. So I think on, on, on many, many levels, this is, it would be a very different situation from 2012. And just because nothing happened in 2012, I, I don't think that in any way uh, proves or indicates that nothing will happen in 2016. So I'm, I'm reading through this. Uh, I, I read through it. Um, it's very interesting. And so there's a lot of this is very polarizing. It's one of those issues that is very idealistically charged uh, in, in a sense, uh, like many 
issues, I guess, in Bitcoin. And so we'll put the link to this uh, thread in the show notes. I recommend anybody who wants to learn more about this read it. So Jeff Garzik responds with the argument that hash, the hash rate market is becoming uh, is maturing into the direction of financial instruments where the owner of the hash power is not necessarily one receiving the income. Um, they're becoming tradable instruments, so there's a complexity of... So mining is not just you know, this sort of simple, like one person mine, one person gets the revenue uh, model. It's becoming some much more complex than that as we add more layers uh, to hedge risk. Um, what, what, what do you think? How do you think that... I think, in this I think that answer doesn't make a lot of sense, to be honest. I mean, if anything, if mining becomes more tradable and all that, it increases the scenario for this. Right? So that, that makes it more, much more likely because then you're able to like acquire all this hashing power without actually having to physically own it and, and physically move it and everything. So I, I don't I don't think this is uh, deals with the issue at all. I mean, there, there, of course, there are some there are some things to be said. I think um, something Adam Back brought up in the podcast we did on sidechains was that you know in the future, uh, let's say we have big banks getting into Bitcoin, then they could operate or they could buy some hashing power and say you know we operate that just to keep Bitcoin secure. So they're not trying to make money with that, but Maybe they're trying not to lose money, but not so important for a big bank. To because an operating bank. expense. Yeah, it's just like uh, it's sort of like a donation, I guess, to the Bitcoin network that you say, like, oh, we put in some money to keep Bitcoin secure, and we're okay with losing money in that or, or not making money. And of course, that is very much true, right? So if we have miners who aren't profit oriented. So the same may be true for some people who just love Bitcoin, right? They they may say I'm not joining this attack because uh, you know because I care about Bitcoin and I just don't do that for moral reasons or for reasons of altruism, and and that can offer some protection, right? So I think that that would be one way to protect it. And I guess in 2012 also that was much more the case, but. Yeah. That, I don't so so the, the the kamikaze scenario, the, the only thing protecting us from the kamikaze scenario is people loving the Bitcoin ecosystem and not wanting it to, to fail. Uh, if they have any economical um, incentives, uh, then they would definitely go for for that. Well, the, and, and there's, I guess, another thing. Uh, I think, I don't know, we, we, we talked about it briefly before, is uh, to some extent centralization is a protection uh, against this, right? Because... Uh, let's say in the extreme case... That, that's a bold statement. Please explain. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not saying it's positive for Bitcoin, right? Of course, it's like, of course, we don't want Bitcoin to be decentralized. But in this case, centralization would actually offer some protection. Because let's say a Bitfury owns the majority of hashing power. Like, they completely control Bitcoin mining. And now I'm going to try to attack Bitcoin that way. Well, of course, it's not possible to do it unless Bitfury joins the attack. But would Bitfury join the attack? No, of course not, right? Because the whole business is like the Bitcoin thing, and like they're not going to destroy their own business. So, and you know, I mean, that's the extreme case if there's one party. But let's say three different companies control the Bitcoin network. Um, and they all sort of cooperate with each other, know each other. Then as well, if these three companies talk with you, just say like, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. You know, so that can also be protection, right? So if if, if there's a small circle of uh, companies controlling Bitcoin mining, uh, you know, the chance of this succeeding is definitely lower. Well, this, which is the case now, I would say, you know. Now, yeah, I, I don't know how it would be now. It it. It might, yeah. You might be right. I'm, I'm not sure. I think it may be, it may be somewhere in the middle, right? And, and I think actually, then you get, you get sort of tricky, right? Because there's, at the extreme end, if it's very centralized, uh, it will probably protect from an attack like this. If it's very decentralized, let's say if, if Bitcoin users themselves own the hardware, it may also protect from it. But then if it's somewhere in the middle, you know, if there's a lot of like a sort of if there's some sort of oligopoly of 20 companies who all sort of distrust each other and like then again maybe it's more possible right because you can directly bribe people there's a few people to talk to beforehand maybe uh, 
So yeah, and of course, uh, the point is more: we don't want Bitcoin security to depend on centralization, right? Like that's that wasn't the point, right? That the whole point was decentralization. So if, if Bitcoin security relies on it being more centralized, you know, that's that's not what we wanted. I mean, then then it's like Ripple, right? Where Ripple controls, uh, you know, all the nodes. That 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 of course is also secure against an attack. Like somebody can't just go take over the Ripple network because Ripple controls the Ripple network. But then that's one of the criticisms always for Ripple is that well it's it's centralized. So you you have another topic here in the rundown. I don't know how this ties into it, but security versus security state at or at stake ratio. Can you explain? Um, yeah, I don't know if that's always a well phrased uh, term, but I, I guess one one way also to think about the, the security of Bitcoin, right, is that, that you sort of have this ratio of what does it cost to attack, what does it cost to take over the majority of the hashing power versus how much could one potentially gain, right? So, so how much is, like, secured by the blockchain? So the sort of, of course, most obvious thing is Bitcoin itself, right? So the value of the market cap of Bitcoin. So we would want for Bitcoin to be secure, we would want the, the cost of attacking be as as large a proportion as possible of the market cap of Bitcoin. I mean, ideally, you know, if it cost you $3 billion to attack, attack Bitcoin and Bitcoin itself is only worth $3 billion, you know, that, that would be a pretty high degree of security. Um, but especially with uh, some the way some people see Bitcoin evolving, we would have Bitcoin not only secure the currency itself, but secure all kinds of other things, right? And and to some extent we have that already, right? Like a uh, counterparty, master coin assets, those things are all secured by the Bitcoin blockchain as well. So those things could also increase the incentive to attack Bitcoin. And um, there was there was a nice episode recently of Beyond Bitcoins uh, with Meher Roy. I think we're going to have them on here as well sometime with the Internet of Money. And he mentioned something. Um, he talked about this as well. Right? So there's the idea, for example, let's say people start having a stock exchange that like tra is traded with the Bitcoin blockchain or something like that. Um, and then Apple stock is secured by the Bitcoin blockchain. Well, but Apple's worth six hundred billion dollars, right? Like, how much of an incentive does that create to attack Bitcoin? If like, you know, you can attack Apple stock somehow, or like, I don't know, d double spend Apple stock, or like, you know, you could add those things on top. So, so one of the issues with, um, I guess, some of the the ideas that the sidechains guys have of like the Bitcoin blockchain securing a really wide range of things is that that also increases the incentive to attack Bitcoin, right? So so how how can you keep Bitcoin secure um, if you go in that direction? It, it's not clear to me really. So this is, uh, this is all very Comforting news, Brian. Is there any other scenario mm -hmm. than this like doomsday scenario where Bitcoin just disappears because it's not secure? Um, I mean, what are what are some other scenarios that we can ex that we could postulate uh, when this block having uh, block reward having happens? Well, I mean, one thing I was thinking about. And and maybe some people who know this better uh, can correct me here. But to me, it just seems like this is a little bit of a design mistake. Like, why? Why every four years? Like, why isn't it not continually decreasing? Why is it not every week? Why doesn't the block reward decrease every week by, I don't know, half a percent or whatever it works out to? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe there's some thinking behind the every four would, years. Would that change anything? That wouldn't change the fact that you're at some point your uh, the cost of running mining hardware is going to be below what it costs you to well, no, what, would, what you're receiving it in terms of uh, uh, it would change rewards. things because you don't have to like from one day to the next like dramatically 
did this huge transition where from one day to the next, mining hardware loses a lot of value and comes the hash rate drops, all of that. You wouldn't have that, right? It would be much more gradual. So this this like sort of perfect storm of now it becomes really cheap to attack Bitcoin and the difficulty, uh, you know, the hash rate collapses. Like that's something that you wouldn't have then. So, I mean, one thing that I was thinking about is like, well, maybe one could change that. It, it also doesn't seem like that controversial a change, right? Because it's, it can still keep the 21 million. You can still have that sort of decrease. Like for miners, it should actually, I don't see why it would be a big disadvantage for miners. Uh, I, I don't think it would be a disadvantage at all, actually. And it would somewhat increase Bitcoin security. Now, it, it wouldn't be like a, complete solution, right? I mean, I, I did think of this attack scenario actually before I thought of the the block halving situation, but but it would definitely, I would definitely lessen the, ch the chance of this happening. Has anybody else that you know suggested something like that? I think someone mentioned in that Bitcoin dev uh, thread, someone mentioned that idea, but you see, I think that's one of the problems with things like that. Like we can talk about this now, sort of theoretically, and I'm sure some people will will give us reasons why this is not likely, right? I'm sure some people will say, but no, it will be different, and like people will, some people will disagree with me. Some people will say I was wrong here, and maybe I am, you know. Like we don't know. Um, so, and I think the danger always with things like that is that we don't do anything until something happens, right? Because like it's just an abstract scenario right now, and then if something happens, it is you know it's too late. So that's that's one thing I've been thinking about is that you know maybe one should have a more proactive way of thinking some of the some of these issues, and maybe one should not view them as so like set in stone, right? Like Bitcoin was defined like that with Satoshi, and it's going to stay like that. Like, like those fundamental design periods, maybe, maybe one would say, like, oh, we re-examine that and maybe make some changes. Well, one thing's for sure is that uh, now that you've sort of laid out this attack vector, this attack scenario, um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> now somebody could conceivably try to do that. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, so talking about it, I, I don't it think I don't think this was like this is like a creative enough idea that somebody wouldn't like people wouldn't think of it anyway. Like I, I like most of these things are not original, right? The block halving. I don't know if this mining pool. But it's not it's not an unusual idea. So I don't think uh, I don't take the credit of having come up with something very original <laughs> here. <laughs> Yeah. You're going to take responsibility for Bitcoin failing, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> because it was episode 68 of episode of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, no, so I don't think it will be that. You know, this is this will be obvious. But, you know, in the end, you know, there, there's a George Soros you know, made, made like a billion pounds or something in the 70s by shorting the British pound. You know, he kind of broke the pound. Um, once we start having this being really traded as a financial instrument, I mean, hedge funds constantly try to like short markets and break them and like rig them and et cetera, et cetera. You know, like, and this is, this will just be another thing like that. You know, I mean, I, I think we are sort of protected at the moment because Bitcoin is like isolated from the rest, right? It's isolated from the financial system. But it won't be forever, at least not if. Bitcoin actually lives up to its promise and and becomes more successful. And yeah, I, I think. So, sorry, I, I, but I think that at least having this discussion is is very valuable. I mean, a lot of people like when you read these mailing lists or when you read Reddit and people bring up topics like this, it, it just gets so polarized. It's like you know the people that sort of are ideologically charged. Uh, they're they're. Um, this course is ideologically charged, and and others where uh, you know sort of having more of a realist um, view of things, and and, and there's and often a clash there saying oh, we shouldn't even talk about this because it's it's pointless. But no, it's not pointless. These are real problems that we need to. And get. yeah, and you're right. And the other thing I guess is there are so many things to work on with Bitcoin, right? There's like right. so so many. Uh, 
so many construction sites going on, so many things that need to be improved. And so, so the question is, like, do you now prioritize trying to prevent some potential disaster scenario a few years down the line versus like working on these immediate problems right here? And and that's a very difficult trade-off to make. And and I think people always favor that thing that's right here in front of them. And we tend to, I think we as human beings tend to sort of ignore and put off the thing, the threatening thing that maybe is further down the line and isn't immediately visible or urgent right now. So I think that is that is a challenge here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, it's a very interesting uh, topic, and uh, I look forward to seeing your talk in uh, Berlin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, if you if you come uh, to the conference, listen to the show, and then uh, get in touch, we'd love to meet up. Yeah, and so there'll be a meetup on Wednesday night. Right, there's a meetup on Wednesday night. As you're going to give a talk. I'm going to give a talk on uh, Bitcoin in France. It's going to be very short. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I'll be giving a talk on you know, what's what's happened in the past year uh, in terms of Bitcoin uh, startups. Uh, you know what's happening in France. Um, there's, there are some things happening. Uh, I've 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 found some things to talk about. Good. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it's you. Then uh, Flavien Chalon, who we've also had on oh. from Coin Prism. He's going to give a talk. He's also French. Also French. Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, get in touch also if you want to meet up at a conference, you know, you can make the meet up or something for coffee, like totally. Yeah, definitely. I can't um, wait to leave tomorrow. I'm like, so I'm so excited to be going in, to go into Berlin for a week, uh, you know, just kind of changing, um, changing uh, Environment. environments yeah. and uh, being at the Bitcoin Center and meeting everybody there. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a very interesting week and very, I think it's going to be very inspiring. I hope so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we'll come out with lots of good ideas and, and how to how to improve the show and what kind of things we can do in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, I look forward to that. Look forward also to being back next week with another episode. And uh, thanks so much for listening to the show. I, you know, there was one thing in my talk. I have this like disclaimers, like oh, I'm going to talk about something. But by the way, I need, I need to make some statements here first. Like I still believe in cryptocurrencies. This is still going to be great. Like. <laughs> so, so I'd like to say those things too. I, I haven't even bought, I haven't even sold any bitcoins. <laughs> yeah. So thanks so much for listening. You know, we'll be back next week. If you want to follow us on Twitter, we're at Epicenter BTC. Um, you can also give us a tip in uh, unobtainium, Litecoin, Darkcoin, or whatever other currency using the shifty thing, or at EpicenterBitcoin.com/tips. Uh, and you know, you can sub. Subscribe to our newsletter, episode of the Bitcoin.com slash newsletter. Uh, see you then.